Nearing the end of the second millennium of the Common Era, a ragtag group of college students committed to film the story of a demon running rampant at a northwestern college campus. In the year 1999, the Pacific Lutheran Film Society gathered their resources and set about spinning their tale. What began as a short clip grew until it became a full-length feature film. Operating with an utterly inexperienced cast and crew and funded with a virtually non-existent budget, the movie quickly vanished into the mists of obscurity. Undaunted, the crew pressed on, eventually recreating themselves as the dead gentlemen, wherein they achieved widespread success among the role-playing community for their even lower-budget niche piece, The Gamers. Five years after its forging, their first feature would re-emerge as a package attached to the release of, of all things, its own sequel. In the year of our show, 2012, it was determined that this early attempt at horror-humor fusion should be held to the scrutiny of review, unleashing the floodgates of bad jokes, terrible acting, amateurish editing, and poorly thought-out sidebar segments, The Ruleteers, sallied forth. This is... If you got tired of waiting for our text crawl to end, then we have good news for you. Our film today begins with a much longer, much slower text crawl that establishes the narrative's backstory. It seems that a thousand years ago, there was this demon named Duomerthrax, see? He was all, like, tough and stuff. Then some demon hunters banded together and, like, trapped him in a statue. Now it's, like, a thousand years later and he's been unleashed on a campus of unsuspecting college kids who can act. See how quick that was? On with the movie. Upon escaping, Dwamerthrax the Indestructible proceeds to meander around random sets, killing random extras, and doing the best darn Freddy Krueger impression he can muster. Most of these guys are singularly forgettable, but holy shit, look at this fucking guy. Just, just listen to this. Weak-minded idiot reporters such as these cannot fill my editorial needs. Those who spawned thee were never meant to wield the pen. I shall remedy the situation and terminate all their positions. I terminate thee! I terminate thee! I terminate thee! I terminate thee! They shall never volunteer for my newspaper so long as I live! So it's me! That is... That's just sublime. This guy is like a bodhisattva of bad acting. I can't describe this. They should have sent a poet. The titular demon hunters are introduced doing what college kids are best known for. Just kind of hanging around. My favorite is this guy. Paul Blackthorne wishes he looked this much like Harry Dresden. Either way, a call comes in that a demon has become active nearby, and they gather their equipment and dispatch. I can't help but notice that some of their equipment involves a nondescript computer component and a disc tray from a Performa 600. Alright, I guess I'm ready to fight demons now! The movie introduces us to Chris, our hapless everyman, tasked with being clueless so that the demon hunters can explain all of the details that the audience wouldn't know otherwise. He's going on a weekend trip with his girlfriend to Dead Camper Lake. In preparation, he heads to work to turn in his time card. What's a time card? A remnant of an era long dead, dear girl. While he's looking for a contact of the Smithsonian so that he can sell his ancient relic, he meets this guy. This guy is unfucking believable I don't know what is up with this dude, but I think that his direction must have gone something like this. Alright, Kurt, in this scene, you are a fuckhead. A fuckhead, eh? Like a uh, Zynga marketing employee or like a high school gym teacher? I'm thinking Fox Opinion Anchor. Become the fuckhead. You are fuckhead incarnate. You are the fuckest of heads. Got it. Limp Biscuit cover band frontman. Dwarmothrax kills everyone and chases Chris down, but for some reason lets him go. Luckily, the demon hunters have arrived and it's time for the fight scene. Boot to the head! Their manliest of hunters seemingly vanquishes the beast, but he's only playing possum. We're already being introduced to how indestructible Dwarmothrax really is. While it's sad that we're losing a hero, we are getting a consolation prize. One of his worst lines in the movie, followed by immediately by one of his best. Shake well before opening! Booyah! 
Satan rules. Back in the van, the demon hunters introduce themselves and allow Chris to fulfill his purpose as a clueless jack-off so that they can exposition dump. They are members of the Brotherhood of the Celestial Torch, and they work directly for God. That's not an acronym or a title, by the way. They work for the actual God of Abraham, from the Torah, the Testaments, and the Quran. If this is the case, why doesn't he intervene on their behalf against the immortal and indestructible demon who is meandering about and ending the lives of innocent youths? Whatever. I really like the scenes of them revealing the tattoos, and I guess that's a good thing, because they do it anytime someone says the Brotherhood of the Celestial Torch. You know, we need something like that anytime someone says film-inflicted trauma. It's more important that we ask questions about the foe that the supposedly omnipotent and all-compassionate god we work for is leaving to be handled by mortals who are hopelessly outclassed. It seems Dwamerthrax is the last remnant of a breed of demons called Earthwalkers. Why is he called an Earthwalker? It means he walks the earth and he doesn't make his home in hell. Why is that? They kicked him out. What? Why? He was too mean. Damn! After letting all this sink in, Chris remembers his lady and rushes to her house to try and save her. Man, I love the way this guy runs. Every time I see it, all I can think is he's getting ready to audition for springtime for Hitler and is practicing his swasta step. As is to be expected, she's already dead. At least we think she is. If not, then she's out of the movie and no one will miss her. Especially because we get to enjoy this. Get used to these if you want to keep up with the dead gentlemen. I'm trying to remember one of their projects that does not eventually involve one of these seeking item POV shots. I'm thinking maybe Journey Quest? Either way, they narrowly escape, managing to lose only a single hunter during the fight. Luckily, it's Lord Badspeak, the guy who previously gave us these perfect readings. Kid, did you drink a kind of dumbasses moroning? No, but you're big fans. They flee to an abandoned dorm room or attic or something. They manage to find a file in the Brotherhood's database outlining Dwamerthrax's one and only weakness, while Chris remembers his girlfriend in soft focus. They take the time here to introduce us to each of the demon hunters, Albrick, their resident specialist in werewolves and shapeshifters. He speaks in the worst Australian accent you've heard since Sky Commanders. Next is RM, or Rigor Mortis. She specializes in bloodsuckers, zombies, other forms of the undead, having a high school goth kid's nickname, and deliveries as stiff and wooden as her vampire killing stakes. Gabriel is their leader and divine specialist. He is also among the best actors, one of the only members of the cast who will go on to a real career. His is the best catchphrase. We ride. The dude with the dumb visor is the Cypher, their cyber specialist and computer dude. And finally, there's Silent Jim. He's just called the best hunter in the group and reported as an all-around general badass. They give a little insight into his pathos and explain why he's called Silent Jim. He never says a word, you see. No. Not a word. Oh shit, as we said before, Dwamerthrax is found in their database, including all of his titles. Dwamerthrax is awesome. Dwamerthrax the indestructible, drinker of souls, render of flesh, hunter of the living, impaler of the innocent, scourge of the righteous, bane of the pious, torture of the nice, killer of peasants, cleaver of knights, slicer of queens, dicer of kings, <laughs> Raper of nuns, sodomizer of popes, raiser of villages, arsonist of cities, crumbler of castles, vandal of cathedrals, breaker of the sphinx's nose, bastard, tripper of horses, tipper of cows, slayer of small cute woodland creatures, spreader of plagues, kicker of crutches, pisser inner of holy water, ass wiper of rare paintings, next page. Oh. Decapitator of clowns, disemboweler of tenors, fashion consultant for Marilyn Manson, pimp slapper of bitches, eater of skink. That's enough. The hunters and Chris stock up on a whole bunch of the one substance that Dwarmothrax is vulnerable to. Mint. If that seems odd to you, then you need to read more books. With a fresh supply of Listerine, owl toys, and dental floss, they set about trying to find their prey. Luckily, he appears on a local news program and conveniently lets them know in no unspecific terms that he is winning and that they can't stop him. And now a partial score. Dwarmerthrax the Indestructible, 15. 
Zero for the Brotherhood of the Celestial Torch! They track him down, but still find themselves heavily outmatched. The cipher works out that there is a supernatural doom keeping the demon captive in a small area, which is why he hasn't moved on to make himself more difficult to track. It's also why he's so aggressive. The barrier is equilibrium-based, so he just has to blow up all the dosage centers and disrupt the flow of prosium for one day to achieve emotional freedom. Just kidding. He has to kill 21 people to shatter the metaphysical dome and free himself. Shortly afterwards, the demon appears and murders the cipher, meaning that he needs only four more kills to escape. Four kills to go, four hunters remaining. The math says that he's coming for them. Expecting his attack, they begin setting up the silliest battlefield trap since Return of the Jedi. While Chris and Gabriel do all the fucking work, Rigor Mortis wanders off and proves that she's just as bad at demon hunting as she is wooden and unlikable. She refuses a direct order to return to the group and gets herself killed. She's all washed up! Meanwhile, Silent Jim gets cornered by the demon and forced into a fight without any meant to aid him. In a fight sequence so eloquently choreographed it would make Ben Bayless weep with pride, Jim demonstrates why he is known as such a raging badass. Unfortunately, a vulnerable opponent cannot stand forever against an invulnerable opponent, and Jim is finally bested. After a brief encounter with Gabriel, the demon gets the drop on Chris by disguising himself and engaging one of the greatest exchanges you'll ever hear. Hey! What? Don't sneak up on me like that! I'm sorry. Is everything all right? Yes, I'm fine. We're hunting a demon. A demon? Yes. He's been running around campus killing people. We're trying to trap him in here. Really? Yes. How many people has he killed? I think 18 or 19. I'm not sure. It's 19. Okay. Yeah. And, oh, it's it's terrible. He's got these sharp, pointy teeth and pointy teeth and, he's, and, and, and these these and huge these huge ears. ears right, yeah. Right? And he's got this. And he got, he's got the nose that slopes down and the yeah. and the big pointy chin. And yeah. His, his face is all red with uh -huh. purple chevrons. And does yeah. he look something like this? <laughs> <laughs> Chris and Gabriel are saved when they're joined by another staple of the Dead Gentleman films, the, the Purple, Purple Ninja. Ninja. Another major recurring character in their work, the Purple Ninja makes his first appearance here, looking like a low-rent sixth ranger in a season of Power Rangers College Force. He bests Duomorthrax and begins describing himself to Chris. This brings up a major point that I would like to discuss. The demon hunters are backstabbing turd burglars. As the Purple Ninja is talking, Duomorthrax is able to get the drop on him. Chris was standing right there. He could have warned him of the danger. Instead, he chooses to flee as bravely as Sir Robin, leaving the Purple Ninja to die. Now, with Chris, this would be understandable, because he's an untrained everyman, and something of a coward besides. However, if we go back to the fight between the demon and Wolf early on, we find that the same thing happens, except this time it's the Brotherhood, leaving one of their own to be ambushed and murdered. You know, I'm starting to think that the Brotherhood's motto is actually, I don't have to outrun the monster, I just have to outrun my teammates. Of course, that condemnation doesn't even begin to take into account that this whole group works for what is supposed to be an omnipotent being, who supposedly loves all mankind as its children, and on a level that humans can't even begin to comprehend. Might I say what good parenting skills he has? You have a bear in your house, so you send your five-year-old armed with a pointy stick to kill it while you kick back with a beer and some Monday night football. Either way, Gabriel's trap finally works. They burn the demon with mint, and in his zeal to escape, he is decapitated by the most hilarious special effect in history. They subsume his ashes in minty Listerine and declare the horror to be over. Or is it? Gabriel postulates that perhaps the dome is shattered because the purple ninja and Dwamerthrax himself would balance the equilibrium inside and end the magic. Could this mean that their defeat of the monster was all part of his plan? Well, it's best not to dwell too long on the possibility because Gabriel has to check in. He recruits Chris into the Brotherhood because apparently there's nothing left for him at college now that his girlfriend is dead. Good foresight, buddy. With the demon vanquished and the beginnings of a new team, there's nothing left to do but end the movie on a saved world in a catchphrase. We ride. Or is there? And that is the Demon Hunters. So what do we think of it? Well, honestly, it's really fun. The characters are likable, some way more than others. The jokes are cheesy in the extreme, but they're delivered with such zeal that you really just can't help but enjoy them. The film is not, however, without its flaws. The cinematography is amateurish, the editing is choppy and poor, and the acting is abysmal pretty much throughout. But does this make it a bad movie? 
Well, you have to consider that this was their first attempt at a full-length feature film. While it doesn't come off as over long, there are a number of long, draggy scenes that were obviously inserted just to pad the movie to its full two hours. And that's their biggest problem. The movie clocks in at 120 minutes, and it only really needed an hour and a half tops. There are a lot of long, long, long scenes that were probably put there to humanize the victims, but it really just comes off as padding. All in all, if you like cheesy horror movies or the horror fusion comedy genre, then this film is definitely up your alley. And while it does say something for the quality, you can buy this film's sequel, Dead Camper Lake, and Demon Hunters comes packaged with it. The price they're asking is extremely reasonable for the product they're providing, and we highly recommend checking out some of their other work, including Journey Quest, Dead Camper Lake, Dorkness Rising, and The Gamers, which Fox here will be reviewing on his own page. Come on up to Indianapolis this August for Gen Con, and see the dead gentleman. And while you're at it, keep your eye out for us. Until next time, this has been Film Inflicted Trauma. We ride. I'm in my baby in